Good evening. It's Thursday, November 11th. President Joe Biden, the father of an Iraq war veteran, uses his first Veterans Day in office to announce an effort to better understand, treat, and identify medical conditions suffered by troops deployed to toxic environments. It centers on lung problems suffered by troops who breathe in toxins and the potential connection between rare respiratory cancers and time spent overseas breathing poor air. The United Nations Climate Conference in Glasgow, Scotland, scheduled to close tomorrow, and 11th hour negotiations continue on issues like phasing out fossil fuels and assistance for low-income countries hit hard by global warming. The defense rests its case today in the Wisconsin murder trial of Kyle Rittenhouse, setting the stage for closing arguments on Monday in the shootings that left a Americans divided over whether he was a patriot taking a stand against lawlessness or an armed partisan enforcing vigilante justice. California's top health official, Dr. Mark Galley, urging widespread use of a booster dose of a COVID-19 vaccine, especially as the holiday season approaches. Ten House Democrats to introduce a House resolution to censure. Arizona Republican Representative Paul Gosar for tweeting a video that included altered animations showing him striking at the neck of New York Congresswoman Alexandria Ocasio-Cortez with a sword. And Thousand March in Warsaw today to mark Poland's Independence Day, led by far-right groups calling for strong borders. While Polish troops block hundreds of new attempts by migrants to enter the country illegally from neighboring Belarus in a tense standoff. From Pacifica Radio, KPFA in Berkeley, KPFK in Los Angeles, this is the Evening News. I'm Mark Miracle. President Joe Biden today used his first Veterans Day in office to announce an effort to better understand, identify, and treat medical conditions suffered by troops deployed to toxic environments. Biden has hypothesized about a potential link between his son Bo's death from an aggressive brain cancer after his return from Iraq and exposures to toxins in the air, particularly around massive pits where the U.S. military burns waste. We're going to work with Congress, Republicans and Democrats together to make sure our veterans receive the world-class benefits that they've earned and meet the sacred the specific care specific needs that they each individually need. That means expanding presumptive conditions for toxic exposure, particulate matter, including Agent Orange and burn pits. We're going to keep pushing on this front to be more nimble and responsive, reviewing all the data and evidence to determine additional presumptive conditions that make sure our veterans don't have to wait to get the care they need. The new federal effort is also designed to make it easier for veterans to make claims based on their symptoms, to collect more data from troops who are suffering, and to give veterans more time to make medical claims after symptoms such as asthma and sinus problems develop. The new rules will allow veterans to make claims within 10 years of service. And the government has changed how it determines what symptoms count and why. The U.S. military has been aware for years of health risks associated with open-air burn pits. It's not clear that there will be any help for the civilians in Iraq and Afghanistan, likewise ex exposed to toxic air pollution from the burn pits. President Biden honored Veterans Day at Arlington National Cemetery, <clears throat> paying homage to Americans who have served and laying a wreath at the Tomb of the Unknown Soldier, which marked its 100th anniversary. Caroline Malone reports. 
A solemn wreath-laying ceremony took place at Arlington's National Cemetery in Virginia on Wednesday. It's the centennial Remembrance Day of the so-called Fallen Soldier, an anonymous infantry man who died in France in World War I. He was laid to rest at the tomb of the unknown soldier. U.S. President Biden said it was his single greatest honor to remember U.S. veterans on the day. To all our veterans, past and present, we thank you, we honor you, and we remember always what you've done for us. A federal holiday is observed on November 11th, the day World War I ended. Other countries commemorate November 11th as Armistice or Remembrance Day. Caroline Malone reporting. Veterans Day is always marked on November 11th and recognizes all U.S. veterans who have served on behalf of their country. Suzanne Potter has more. This Veterans Day, Americans are pulling together in support of a new Medal of Honor museum set to break ground in February or March in Arlington, Texas. The museum also will feature a leadership institute to inspire the next generation. A new public service announcement about the museum features former presidents George W. Bush, Bill Clinton, and Barack Obama. The Medal of Honor is awarded for bravery in combat to those who go above and beyond the call of duty. Of the estimated 40 million people who have served in the United States military since the Civil War, fewer than 4,000 have received the honor. Construction will take two years. The U.S. House recently voted unanimously to take the first steps toward creating a Medal of Honor memorial on the National Mall, and the bill is now in the Senate. 66 Medal of Honor recipients are still alive. Lieutenant Colonel Will Swenson earned the award for his leadership during a firefight in Afghanistan where his team lost five service members and ten local allies. This isn't about individual service members. It's about our collective story. What this is really about is telling a story about American values. You see patriotism, you see selfless service, and you see commitment to your community. Navy SEAL and retired astronaut Chris Cassidy is president of the National Medal of Honor Museum. What people don't know about the Medal of Honor is that the recipients are just normal people setting out to do their job on a given day. Each of us have the same bucket of courage. There's endless amounts of it. You can dip into it as much as you want and it never goes away. Cassidy says backers have contributed more than $100 million so far, but the project will cost about $185 million to complete. Learn more at mohmuseum.org. For California News Service, I'm Suzanne Potter. Find our eight trust indicators to support transparency and accuracy at publicnewsservice.org. Beyond the Veterans Day parades and official commemorations like those at the Tomb of the Unknown Soldiers at Arlington National Cemetery in Virginia are a number of informal tributes and memorials to members of the nation's armed forces who have lost their lives during their service. Nadia Ramlagan has that story. Tennessee researchers are examining how service members honor their own and what spaces and activities help them reflect and remember. Beyond one day a year, Katrina Finkelstein is a Ph.D. student in the Department of Geography at the University of Tennessee, Knoxville. She explains that at camps and bases across the nation, service members have created their own intimate memorials and commemorative spaces. She cites a remote hillside near Camp Pendleton in California, covered with crosses and mementos, such as combat knives, helmets, and unopened beer and liquor bottles, all piled at the base of the crosses. So the amount of visitation that this site receives is really what struck me about it, and that's what I think makes it a living memorial. Contributing to the memorials has become an ongoing tradition, Finkelstein says, after 13 service members were killed in a blast at the Kabul airport in August, including nine Marines and one sailor based at Pendleton, new crosses appeared on the hillside. Finkelstein says service members will continue adding to the site to remember those lost during the withdrawal from Afghanistan. And I know from communicating with some of those service members that there are plans for that battalion now that they've returned to add another cross of their own to remember those service members. She explains that veterans' personal memorials reflect when they served, where they served, and who they served with. So respecting that, you know, everyone's memory will be different, but that there is a way to also collectively recall that and um, honor that. Finkelstein says the Camp Pendleton hillside is the site of an ever-expanding memorial and an example of how veterans continue to return to a place of common ground for remembrance and healing. (laughs) This is Nadia Ramlagan for Tennessee News Service. Meanwhile, hunger and homelessness afflict the lives of far too many American veterans. Mary Sherman reports. 
On this Veterans Day, the nation honors those who served the military, now about 19 million people, including Tim Keefe. When I flew into the Navy in Boston, I was ready and willing to give my life for this country. And it seemed like during this time, I couldn't even get a sandwich from them. Keefe testified about his struggles with food insecurity during a House hearing Wednesday. After he suffered a work injury and became homeless, Keefe received food assistance benefits, but was cut off after three months when he couldn't meet job requirements. Unfortunately, I can tell you for, firsthand that when you have gone a couple of days without food, your whole being cries out for it. The desperation I can't explain. Homelessness is another challenge faced by about 40,000 veterans. CEO of the National Coalition for Homeless Veterans, Catherine Monet, says the Build Back Better plan includes significant investments to address the problem. When I say significant, I mean truly game-changing, right? $25 billion in rental assistance, $15 billion for the Housing Trust Fund, and $455 million for the Enhanced Use Lease Program. And during a White House ceremony honoring veteran caregiving families, Defense Secretary Lloyd Austin said there's a new effort to better support military families in transition. Our military families make us a stronger, a healthier, and a more ready force. So we have to make sure that our phenomenal military families can not only survive the hard times, but they can actually thrive throughout their service. I'm Mary Sherman for Pacifica Network and Public News Service. A federal appeals court today temporarily blocked the release of records sought by a U.S. House committee investigating the January 6th insurrection as the court considers an emergency request by former President Donald Trump. The U.S. Court of Appeals for the District of Columbia Circuit granted an administrative stay sought by Trump. The stay is intended to give the court time to consider Trump's arguments against the release of the documents, which was otherwise scheduled for tomorrow without court intervention. The appeals court set arguments in the case for November 30th. Earlier in the week, a federal judge had rejected former President Trump's bid to block the release of documents on the basis of executive privilege to the House Select Committee. U.S. District Judge Tanya Chutkin on Tuesday had declined to issue a preliminary injunction. And late yesterday, she denied another request from Trump's attorneys to stay the order the subpoena for the National Archives not to turn over records while an appeal is pending. Judge Chutkin said in her last ruling denying the latest request for a delay that Trump is unlikely to succeed on the merits of his claims and did not advance any new facts or arguments that would persuade her to reconsider her earlier order. Ten House Democrats say they will introduce a House resolution to censure Arizona Republican Representative Paul Gosar for tweeting a video that including altered animation showing him splashing at the neck of New York Congresswoman Alexandria Ocasio-Cortez with a sword. The Democrats, led by Jackie Speer of California and Brenda Lawrence of Michigan, say Gosar's Posting goes beyond the pale and calls it a clear-cut case for censure. The two congresswomen who co-chair the Democratic Women's Caucus say they will introduce the resolution tomorrow. Their statement also points the finger at Republican Minority Leader Kevin McCarthy, calling his silence on the issue tacit approval and just as dangerous as the Gosar video. Gosar says the video was not meant to depict harm or violence, calling it instead a symbolic portrayal of a fight over immigration policy. Congresswoman Ocasio-Cortez called Gosar a creepy Congress member who fundraises for neo-Nazi groups. You're listening to the Evening News on KPFA Berkeley, KPFK, Los Angeles, KFCF Fresno, online, kpfa.org. The United Nations Climate Conference in Glasgow, Scotland, COP26 is winding down, scheduled to close tomorrow. But negotiations are still continuing on issues like phasing out fossil fuels and assistance for low-income countries hit hard by climate change. Many activists, meanwhile, are pushing for more concrete action. Christopher Martinez reports. 
The United Nations COP26 climate summit has been called the last best hope to avoid the worst forms of climate change. But as the meeting approaches its end, some participants are pushing for more concrete action. British Cabinet Minister Alok Sharma is president of COP26. Now look, whilst we have made progress, and I want to acknowledge the spirit of cooperation and civility that's been demonstrated throughout the negotiations by negotiators and ministers, we are not there yet on the most critical issues. There is still a lot more work to be done. And COP26 is scheduled to close at the end of tomorrow. So time is running out. Over the last days, COP26 has resulted in some progress. Denmark and Costa Rica have formed a first-of-its-kind alliance to phase out oil and gas production. California and New Zealand have joined as associate members, although the largest producing nations have not joined. The U.S. and China have agreed to cooperate on cutting emissions of methane, a powerful greenhouse gas. That deal is soft on specifics, like deadlines, but at the very least it does have symbolic value, and that can be important. Archie Young is Britain's leading climate negotiator. I very much welcome the fact that uh, this is an agreement that out, sets out cooperation between uh, the world's two biggest uh, emitters. I think that is uh, good news, and what I hope is that the spirit of cooperation in that agreement is also going to drive forward the negotiations here at COP26. The goal of the summit is to take action to limit climate change to below 2 degrees Celsius and as close as possible to 1.5 degrees. But climate goals so far fall short. Antonio Guterres is Secretary General of the United Nations. He says climate goals are, in his words, on life support. Keeping the 1.5 goal within reach means reducing emissions globally by 45% by 2030. But the present set of nationally determined contributions, even if fully implemented, would still increase emissions by 2030. According to the latest joint analysis of the nationally determined contributions by UNEP and UNFCCC, we remain on a catastrophic temperature rise track well above 2 degrees Celsius. So net zero pledges require rapid, sustained emissions cuts this decade. Guterres says he's inspired by what he calls the moral voice of young people keeping our feet to the fire. But he adds that governments need to pick up the pace. That's a sentiment shared by many of the youth activists in Glasgow and beyond. Humanity will not be saved by promises. Climate activist Vanessa Nakate was inspired by Greta Thunberg to start a climate movement in her native Uganda. She says nine million people who die each year from air pollution do not have decades to wait for oil and gas to be phased out. She says activists are skeptical, in part because they've heard promises of change before, and also because the largest delegation at COP26 was not from a country, but from the fossil fuel industry. I hope you can understand why many of the activists who are here in Glasgow and millions of activists who could not be here do not see the success that is being applauded within these halls. Her remarks were a criticism, but also, crucially, a challenge. I am here to say, prove us wrong. I'm actually here to beg you to prove us wrong. We desperately need you to prove us wrong. Please, prove us wrong. God help us all if you fail to prove us wrong. Negotiators hope to wrap up a consensus statement Friday, the scheduled closing day. But as negotiations continue on issues like phasing out fossil fuel subsidies and assistance for poor countries, some think the meeting could continue into the weekend. Reporting for Pacifica Radio News KPFA, I'm Christopher Martinez. At COP26, the Indian government launched a web portal for electrical vehicles. The website would be a one-stop destination for all information related to electric vehicles, including their purchase, investment opportunities, policies, and subsidies for Indian consumers. Ishan Garg reports. 
Following the pledge at COP26, India has launched an online portal called eAmrit. Officials say it's intended to push the adoption of electric vehicles, which currently form only 2% of all vehicles sold in the country. India has committed to making a third of all passenger vehicles and three quarters of all commercial vehicles electric by 2030. But experts say low EV adoption is a major challenge. Due to lack of an extensive charging network and high cost of electric vehicles, many in the country still prefer fossil fuel driven vehicles. They account for nearly 15% of all air pollution in the country. Experts believe officials should start small and focus on transitioning the country's hundreds of millions of two-wheeled vehicles to electric vehicles first. Ishan Garg, New Delhi. Hundreds of climate activists took to the streets outside of San Francisco's Ferry Building today. With colorful banners, signs, and homemade puppets, they chanted anti-fossil fuel slogans and climate destruction slogans until reaching Aquatic Park for a rally. Today's protest was one of hundreds that have taken place around the globe during the UN's 26th Climate Change Conference held in Glasgow, Scotland. Stuart Blackwell files this report from San Francisco. COP26. Survival. Or. Blah, blah, blah. Several hundred climate change activists gathered outside of the Ferry Building in San Francisco to demand that leaders take emergency climate action at COP26. The march and demonstration were organized by the Extinction Rebellion SF Bay Area, Sunrise Movement, Black Rock's Big Problem, and the 1000 Grandmothers Bay Area, to name a few. Troy is with Extinction Rebellion. We're here to urge um, leaders, Joe Biden, um, you know, Nancy Pelosi, even, you know, UK leaders that what they don't realize is by 2030, it's going to be too late. Um, we have to stop the idea of uh, net zero is kind of a farce. It means that we're trying to take back what we've already done and we need to actually be peddling backwards, not putting stuff out there and then making it neutral. We need to be peddling backwards. So we're out here today to get that message out that our leaders aren't quite doing it for us. Um, their promises are a little bit uh, short. Hundreds of protesters then marched on Embarcadero to Aquatic Park carrying colorful banners, provocative signs, and handcrafted puppets symbolizing endangered species. At Aquatic Park, tables were set up for writing letters to those in power, and a collective video interview of activists was recorded to be sent to business and government leaders. Well, I think it's important for everyone to feel welcome to a movement. Um, if we can engage with people across the spectrum between age, uh, gender, class, uh, even your housing situation, if we can get everyone together on the same page to kind of... Um, you really band together and realize what we need is not what we're being offered from the government and uh, what, what we need is to be listened to and to have policy that goes towards environmental justice, which goes into social justice. So that's why it's kind of all linking together and we're getting all of these kind of festive parts out uh, in order to be a little bit regenerative and enjoy, enjoy ourselves. As has been common in protests surrounding COP26, people were asking for systemic change in order to tackle the climate crisis. While many say individual action is important, signs and speeches reminded those passing by that the majority of greenhouse gases come from international industry and resource extraction. Many activists also pointed out that climate change is directly correlated to social inequities. Currently, those least responsible for climate change are those hit hardest by it. Others lamented at the prospects for future generations like Nayeli Maxson Valaquez, an environmental activist. She brought her two children, Maxson, age seven, and Lincoln, age five. When I come to events like this and I bring them to events like this, I feel less depressed and more connected to people who are organizing on the systems level, not just people who are, you know, talking about what types of things they can purchase as an individual or you know, personal decisions that they can make differently, but about like systems level changes that we need to collectively demand. And 
And that's what I keep coming back to when I talk with my kids about it is like, what can we together be demanding? Because, um, you know, you can't put your head in the sand. You have to be connected to reality. But it can be harsh to think about reality too much. While leaders from industrialized nations have proposed plans to reduce greenhouse gas emissions, protesters say more promises by wealthy world leaders, even if actually acted on, will be too little too late. I'm Stuart Blackwell for Climate Countdown on KPFA. Communities dealing with the impacts of climate change in Washington state are closely watching climate legislation in Washington, D.C., People on the front lines of climate change largely are made up of communities of color, lower-income communities, and indigenous people. Eric Tegatoff reports. Derek Gruen is co-executive director of Front and Centered, a coalition of groups in Washington state. He says these are the communities that should be considered first as Congress hammers out details on climate action. We have to keep up the energy level, keep attention on the communities most impacted as the bellwether and those that are going to be the first and able to judge around what's effective and equitable and continuing to double down on our intention in our approach to effectiveness. Gruen says investments at the community scale, such as in solar projects for low-income communities, are vital for ensuring people on the front lines receive the most benefit from climate action. The framework for the Build Back Better Act currently includes $550 billion to cut the country's emissions and could be voted on next week. Gruen says it's unfortunate that the Clean Electricity Payment Program, which would have created incentives for utility companies to transition to clean energy, was cut from the Build Back Better Act. Last week, Congress passed a $1 $1 trillion dollar infrastructure package, but Gruen is concerned about the heavy emphasis on roads and highways. The first step is to stop the harm. We can't keep investing in things like expanding highways and expect our emissions to go down. We can't be continuing to invest in old infrastructure and buildings that aren't built at the highest performance standards. Gruen says it's important that the transition to a cleaner economy doesn't happen on the backs of lower income households. We need a transition that's just and really focused on a real hard look at the future ahead and building and investing towards a future that looks different than it is today and accepting that we're going to have to make some tough choices. For Washington News Service, I'm Eric Tegadoff. The giant metropolitan water district of Southern California has declared a regional drought emergency due to record dry conditions. Directors made the declaration this week in a resolution that calls for increased conservation. Metropolitan serves as a wholesaler to 26 local water agencies that supply the region with 19 million people. Board Chair Gloria Gray says Southern California on average gets about a third of its water from Northern California via the state water project, and next year it will be lucky to get a small fraction of that. Metropolitan's trying to preserve state water project supplies by instead delivering Colorado River water to as much of the region as possible. Water years 2020 and 2021 were the driest two-year sequences on record in the state. Last month, Governor Gavin Newsom expanded the state's emergency drought declaration to include all of California, including major population centers. That order gives state water officials permission to enact mandatory water restrictions. You're listening to the Evening News on KBFA Berkeley, KBFK, Los Angeles, KFC at Fresno, online at kbfa.org. It's an hour-long newscast, and it airs each night at 6 with a half-hour edition on the weekends. I'm Mark Miracle. A federal judge has ordered a halt to enforcement of the Texas ban on mask mandates in the state schools. U.S. District Judge Lee Yackel ruled that the ban ordered by Republican Governor Greg Abbott violated a federal law protecting disabled students' access to public education. The nonprofit advocacy group Disabled Rights Texas argued that Abbott's ban prohibited accommodations for disabled children, particularly vulnerable to COVID-19. The judge's order prohibits Texas Attorney General Ken Paxton from suing school districts that have required students to wear masks as a safety measure. California's top health official, Dr. Mark Galley, is urging widespread use of a booster dose of a COVID-19 vaccine ahead of the holidays. 
for those who've had their primary series, Moderna, Pfizer, more than six months ago, they completed it. Johnson & Johnson, more than two months ago, that if you think you will benefit from getting a booster shot, I encourage you to go out and get it. Supplies available. It's not too late to get it this week. Get that added protection for the Thanksgiving gatherings that you may attend. Certainly going into the other winter holidays. When it approved boosters earlier this fall, the Centers for Disease Control and Prevention urged those 65 and older to get one and said others who fell into risk categories for reasons of health or high exposure could also receive a booster. The CDC turned aside the notion of using booster doses for everyone. But state and some local health officials are warning that waning protection from the first vaccine series in the coming holidays increases the risk of infection and raises concerns about the ability of the state's health care system to respond. Santa Clara County's top health official urging all county residents to get a COVID-19 booster shot as the holiday season approaches. Director of Public Health Dr. Sarah Cody says virtually all county residents qualify if they received the one-shot J&J vaccine more than two months ago or their second Moderna or Pfizer vaccines more than six months ago. We really encourage everyone to get out and get their booster shot. And uh, pretty much everybody in our population is eligible. Those are the top line messages. So we're coming into the holidays. We're coming into one of the busiest travel days a year. And there's a great way to protect yourself and your family and your friends and the community. And that is by getting a booster shot. Cody said studies have shown the protection wanes after six months. Santa Clara County Health Officer Dr. Marty Festerscheib urged residents not to wait until the last minute before traveling or gathering with family members over the holidays. About 20% of people that are eligible um, have been vaccinated uh, with the booster. And I think it's also important to note that those that are 65 and older who are even higher risk, um, only 39% of the 65 and olders have been vaccinated with a booster. This week, Pfizer asked federal regulators to allow boosters of its COVID-19 vaccine for anyone 18 or older. Older Americans and other groups particularly vulnerable to the virus have had access to a third dose of the Pfizer vaccine since September. The CDC turned aside the notion of using booster doses for everyone, but Cody maintains that if you drill down into the CDC's guidelines, they do really apply to just about everyone. You um, may have increased risk of exposure due to your interactions with the public. Uh, you may have an underlying medical condition. Underlying medical conditions include everything, including depression, anxiety, hypertension, diabetes, obesity. There are very few of us who don't fall into one of, you know, meet one of those eligibility criteria. Um, and then when you think about if you have increased risk of exposure because you interact frequently with the public or perhaps you live with someone who interacts frequently with the public. This week, the California Department of Public Health issued new guidelines which says no one seeking a booster should be turned away and the people should be allowed to self-determine their risk. These recommendations run contrary to the plea by the World Health Organization, which is urging wealthy nations to hold off on boosters to the general population, while poor nations remain without enough vaccines to offer even a first dose to their populations. The Native American Health Service has begun COVID-19 vaccinations for children aged 5 to 11. Antonia Gonzalez reports. This week, Indian Health Service officials visited sites in the Oklahoma City area, meeting with local leaders and highlighting IHS COVID-19 vaccination efforts. Indian Health Service Acting Director Elizabeth Fowler spoke at a press event at the Anadarko Indian Health Center promoting youth vaccinations. We are excited that our children can finally get vaccinated, but it's been a long journey to get here. We're one step closer to reaching community immunity 
with the recent authorization of the COVID, the Pfizer COVID-19 vaccine for children ages 5 to 11. Tribal leaders at the press event echoed the sentiments of health officials. Chairman of the Caddo Nation, Bobby Gonzalez, says... COVID-19 has impacted his own family and across the tribe, including children. As a tribal leader, you know, my number one uh, priority is to take action to protect the health as well as mental health and uh, getting as many folks uh, educated about vaccinating, um, you know, uh, our people. And the children are, uh, you know, vulnerable and it's real important that we get our kids vaccinated. According to health officials... IHS is ensuring that pediatric COVID-19 vaccines are quickly distributed and made available to children and their families across Indian country. I'm Antonia Gonzalez. Germany's National Disease Control Center has reported a record high number of more than 50,000 daily coronavirus cases. The infection spike comes as German lawmakers are mulling new legislation that would pave the way for new coronavirus measures. Unlike some of the European countries and the United States, Germany has declined to make vaccinations mandatory for certain categories of workers. About two-thirds of the population is fully vaccinated. Chancellor Angela Merkel said that rate is not high enough to prevent the speedy spread of the virus. Trent Murray reports from Berlin. For the third day in a row, Germany has broken its all-time daily record of COVID-19 cases, with over 50,000 new infections logged Thursday. Up from almost 40,000 the day before, it confirms the resurgence which is gripping Europe's biggest economy is accelerating. Hospitals across the country have begun cancelling day surgeries because of patient pressures. The number of ICU beds available are now at their lowest they have been throughout the pandemic. And one of the country's leading virologists has said new lockdown measures are going to be required in order to slow the spread, something lawmakers will discuss in a special parliamentary session held Thursday. Trent Murray, Berlin. As vaccination rates go up, people are more likely to be traveling this holiday season than they did last year. A doctor in Seattle has some tips for how families can travel more safely. Eric Tegetoff reports. Dr. Avantika Waring with Kaiser Permanente says the CDC still recommends people delay travel until they are fully vaccinated, meaning two weeks after their final shot. Beyond that, she says folks should continue to protect themselves the way they have been. All of the things that we've been doing throughout the pandemic, even beyond vaccination, are still really important. So wearing a mask on the airline and also in any sort of indoor space. Trying to practice social distancing from people who aren't in our immediate family is so important. Washing our hands, avoiding large crowds. Washington State recommends booster shots at least six months after their original Pfizer or Moderna shots for people 65 and older, also those with underlying medical conditions or who live in long-term care facilities. Waring says people should also speak with their doctors about getting a flu shot. This week, the CDC's vaccine advisors voted to approve the Pfizer vaccine for kids ages 5 to 11, giving the green light for children in this age group to get shots. Waring says this opens the door for them to travel safely over the holidays. Having conversations with your kids, I think right now is a great opportunity as we're heading into the next phase of vaccination. Just talk to them about the importance of getting these shots and how it's hopefully going to change things for all of us in the coming weeks and months parents can consult their kids' doctors about getting the COVID-19 vaccination. Waring also advises people to keep in mind the COVID-19 regulations of the places they'll travel. The state and local guidelines might be different based on where you're going, so always look into what the requirements will be when you arrive as far as masking requirements and also whether you'll need to have vaccination documents and that kind of thing. For Washington News Service, I'm Eric Tegedoff. In Northern California today, community members rallied in support of unionizing HelloFresh warehouse workers at the company's Richmond Warehouse. Citing low wages and unsafe working conditions, HelloFresh workers are expected to vote on whether or not to form a union next week. It would be the first union in the meal kit industry, an industry which has developed and grown as a result of the coronavirus pandemic. Lauren Shapiro reports. City council members, clergy, students, environmental activists, and teachers gathered in front of the Richmond HelloFresh warehouse today to offer support to workers organizing a union. 
The union would be the first in the meal kit industry and with nearly a thousand potential members, the largest in the Bay Area in more than 20 years. HelloFresh is the largest meal kit company in the country and has profited substantially during the pandemic. It made $2.4 billion in the U.S. in 2020, more than double its revenue from the prior year. But warehouse workers and union organizers say they're not paid a living wage. According to Labor Union Unite Here, a survey of 233 Richmond HelloFresh workers shows in the past year, 82% worried about paying rent or mortgage, and 43% went hungry because they could not afford to buy food. Local 2850 Unite Here president Ulisa Elena says that many HelloFresh workers end up taking on a second job in order to make ends meet. A lot of workers that work at HelloFresh um, have to have two jobs just in order to make ends meet, to pay rent, um, and to put food on the table. A lot of the workers that work at HelloFresh can't even afford a box of HelloFresh. They can't afford the box that they make. In addition to fighting for raised wages, union advocates say it will help combat unsafe working conditions. The HelloFresh warehouse in Richmond was the site of the largest COVID-19 outbreak in Contra Costa County in 2020, with 171 documented cases and one death. Warehouse workers are also demanding to be treated with respect. In a video posted on social media, HelloFresh workers described having hourly productivity quotas increased and being rushed on the assembly line and through breaks. Warehouse worker Almikar Guzman summarized interactions with the managers as characterized by prioritizing profit over pain. They push us to do more and more because their goal is just to take out more boxes, not to worry about how the worker feels, how tired they are, or how uh, bad they're hurt because there are a lot of co-workers, or a lot of my co-workers uh, working uh, with a lot of pain. HelloFresh workers at the Aurora, Colorado facility are currently casting ballots by mail on whether to unionize, with votes scheduled to be counted by the end of the month. Nearly 900 workers in Richmond are scheduled to receive ballots next week. Votes are scheduled to be tallied on December 15th. Reporting for KPFA News, I'm Lauren Shapiro. The Kellogg Company has filed a lawsuit against its local union in Omaha. It's complaining that striking workers are blocking entrances to its cereal plant and intimidating scab workers who are entering the plant to replace the strikers. The company, based in Battle Creek, Michigan, asked a judge to order the Omaha chapter of the Bakery Confectionery Tobacco Workers and Grain Millers International Union to stop interfering with its business while workers picket outside the plant. The workers in Omaha and at Kellogg's three other U.S. cereal plants in Battle Creek, Lancaster, Pennsylvania, and Memphis, Tennessee have been on strike since October 5th. Two days of contract talks earlier this month failed to produce an agreement. Many school teachers are now without health insurance after the Scranton School Board authorized their health insurance to be cut off if the union went on strike. Emily Scott has that story. More than 800 public school teachers and paraprofessionals in the Scranton School District are entering their seventh day of a strike. As a result of stagnant wages, expensive health insurance plans, and four years without a new contract. Union members say the district's health care proposal from its financial recovery plan may result in higher out-of-pocket costs. Combined with no increase in salaries since 2016, Scranton Federation of Teachers President Rosemary Boland says it's resulted in educators leaving the district. And now we can't attract nor can we retain any new staff. Teachers and parents just don't want to work here anymore because they can't afford it. They can't afford to work in a district where their salary hasn't changed in five years. It's impossible. They have bills too. They have homes. They have mortgages like everybody else. Boland says the district has lost more than 100 teachers and paraprofessionals over the last two years. In a recent statement, the Scranton School District said they're committed to reaching a fair and sustainable contract with the union so students can get back in the classroom. Educators and supporters rallied in Harrisburg yesterday for state aid to help them save programs that have been cut as a result of the Scranton School District's recovery plan, including libraries and middle school band and chorus. Patrick Festa, a third grade teacher in Scranton, says the district's plan is punitive. We want to spread the word to state government and to the Department of Education and to our governor. The state recovery plan has done this in our wonderful city. It has eliminated a long-standing public school three and four-year-old preschool program. It is gone. 
because of recovery. Scranton School District has been in financial recovery status since January 2019 through the State Department of Education. Scranton teachers last went on strike in 2015. That walkout lasted 11 days. I'm Emily Scott with Keystone State News Connection. And you are listening to the evening news on KPFA in Berkeley, California, KPFK in Los Angeles, California, KFCF in Fresno, California, or perhaps you're listening online at kpfa.org. I'm Eileen Alfandari inviting you to join us at 7 each weekday morning for Upfront. We bring you breaking news, hard-hitting interviews, debates, and in-depth analysis. From the halls of the state capitol, to the far reaches of the globe, to the streets of Oakland. On KPFA 94.1 FM, KFCF Fresno 88.1 FM, online at kpfa.org. Join us at 7 a.m. for Upfront. Thousands marched in Warsaw today to mark Poland's Independence Day, led by far-right groups calling for strong borders, while its troops blocked hundreds of new attempts by migrants to enter the country illegally from neighboring Belarus in a tense standoff. Security forces patrolled the capital for the parade, which was peaceful, unlike those in recent years that have seen violence by some extremists. The march was overshadowed though, by events unfolding along Poland's border with Belarus, where thousands of riot police troops and border guards are turning back migrants, many from the Middle East, who are trying to enter the European Union. Makeshift camps have sprung up in forests on the Belarusian side near a crossing at the Polish town of Kuznica, and with temperatures falling and access to the frontier restricted, there are fears of a humanitarian crisis there. EU officials have accused Belarus President Alexander Lukashenko of using the migrants as pawns in a so-called hybrid attack to retaliate for sanctions imposed on his authoritarian regime for a harsh internal crackdown on dissent. With the EU weighing more sanctions on Belarus, Lukashenko threatened to cut off Russian natural gas supplies to Europe that passed through a pipeline in his country. He said, I would recommend the Poles, Lithuanians, and other brainless people to think before they talk. Lucy Huff has more from EU headquarters in Brussels. The EU is considering its options. We're being told that uh, a sanctions package against 30 more officials and organizations could be approved by the end of this week and then signed off by EU foreign ministers on Monday during a meeting here in Brussels that will also target the airlines that are deemed to be responsible for, for targeting or facilitating uh, this human trafficking. Lucy Hoff, Brussels. The UN Security Council discussed the crisis privately but took no action, although six of its Western members condemned the use of human beings whose lives and well-being have been put in danger for political purposes by Belarus and called on the international community to hold Belarus accountable and to stop the inhumane actions. Russia's deputy U.N. ambassador, Dmitry Polyansky, called the EU member's decision to raise the Belarus-Poland issue in the U.N.'s most powerful body a total shame. He said Belarus is not to blame that people who came legally to Belarus want to enter EU countries. More from reporter Simon Marks. Thousands of people have massed there in an effort to seek resettlement in the European Union. But who are they? Where did they come from? And how did they get there? These people came uh, from different countries, from Lebanon, from Syria. Uh, also, there are some Afghanis there. Franek Vyachorka is a senior advisor to Belarusian opposition leader Svetlana Tikhanovskaya. They bought uh, the tour packages and right now they are waiting to be delivered to the border. They, they are also hostages. They are also victims of Lukashenko's regime because they believed he can really uh, deliver them to Germany, but it didn't happen. They just became, became the weapon against the EU. With the crisis intensifying, he says the Belarusian opposition is doing all it can to ensure the EU now holds President Alexander Lukashenko accountable. It's very important that the EU countries uh, will stay united and will make 
a very strong response to Lukashenko. This is the guy who understands only the language of force. So we hope on Monday there will be a strong round of sanctions and we hope the US also will support the sanctions. He's been speaking from Prague where he's been lobbying Czech officials. Svetlana Tikhanovskaya herself is in Germany meeting the country's incoming Chancellor Olaf Scholz. Humanitarian conditions at the border are rapidly worsening. Simon Marks, Washington. Russia sent two nuclear-capable strategic bombers on a trading mission over Belarus for a second straight day today in a strong show of Moscow's support for its ally amid the dispute. The Belarusian defense minister said two Russian Tu-160 strategic bombers practiced bombing runs at the Ruzani firing range located in Belarus, but just about 37 miles east of the border with Poland. As part of the joint training, Belarusian fighter jets simulated an intercept. The missions marked the second time in two days that Russia sent its nuclear-capable bombers into the skies over Belarus. In Kenosha, Wisconsin today, the defense rested its case at Kyle Rittenhouse's murder trial. The 18-year-old is charged with killing two protesters and wounding another at a demonstration against the police killing of an African-American man, Jacob Blake, last year. Rittenhouse could get life in prison if convicted. The case has divided Americans over whether Rittenhouse was a patriot taking a stand against lawlessness or a vigilante. Christina Onestad reports. Kyle Rittenhouse faces life in prison for fatally shooting two men protesting the police killing of a black man, Jacob Blake, and wounding another with an AR-15 semi-automatic rifle he brought to the rally. He faces five criminal charges, including two first-degree homicide charges, including two first-degree homicide charges for killing Joseph Rosenbaum and Anthony Huber, an attempted homicide for wounding Gage Grosskreutz and illegal possession of a weapon by a person under 18 years of age. His defense attorneys rested their case, painting Rittenhouse, who was 17 years old at the time, as an innocent, scared boy who was under attack and acted in self-defense. One of the last testimonies for the defense tried to reinforce that image and came from a right-wing provocateur, Drew Hernandez. He called for bloodshed after Donald Trump lost the 2020 presidential election and videotaped the protests in Kenosha, Wisconsin, the night Rittenhouse killed two people, but on the stand described him as someone who was trying to de-escalate things. Your contact with Kyle that evening was just in terms of what you observed, I'm asking. Did you observe him acting in an aggressive manner to anyone that you observed? In no way, shape, or form. The first time I saw Kyle, he actually de-escalated a situation. Did you observe him at any time uh, that evening pointing his firearm at anybody or threatening anybody with that firearm? No. Hernandez, who now works for the right-wing media group Real America's Voice, then painted Rittenhouse's first victim, Joseph Rosenbaum, as the aggressor, in line with other testimony from the defense and prosecution during trial. The first time I saw Mr. Rosenbaum was when the police were pushing the riders back to uh, the gas station um, on Sheridan Ultimate, I believe. And uh, Mr. Rosenbaum was pushing a flaming dumpster on fire into police vehicles that were occupied by officers and human beings. When the Kenosha County Assistant District Attorney Thomas Binger tried to draw out the potential bias from Hernandez, presiding judge Bruce Schroeder wasn't having it. Does Real America's Voice have any sort of um, political uh, bias or agenda or anything like that? I'm, what is the it goes to the bias of the witness, Your Honor. Yeah. Uh, the bias in what respect? I, I assume that people... Are, we, uh, as I come at the beginning, this is not a political trial. In another instance, when the prosecutor tried to draw out Hernandez's bias, Judge Schroeder interrupted, questioned the move, then broke for lunch. Schroeder has repeatedly clashed with the prosecution. The previous day when Rittenhouse testified in his own defense, Schroeder lashed out at the prosecution, alleging Binger was trying to include evidence that was excluded from the trial. The evidence was a statement from Rittenhouse in the days leading up to the shooting that he wished he had a gun to shoot shoplifters. Defense attorneys then filed a request for a mistrial.
During the trial, Schroeder was photographed reading a cookbook during testimony and social media posts of his cell phone ringing during the trial to the tune of a song used at rallies for former President Donald Trump have gone viral. The bad faith on the part of the prosecution and if the court makes a finding that uh, the actions that I had talked about. Critics say Schroeder is showing bias in favor of Rittenhouse. Eli Mistel, justice correspondent at The Nation magazine, told Democracy Now! Judge Schroeder has been on Rittenhouse's side before the trial even began. All the decisions that Bruce Schroeder has made, they have been heavily balanced and weighted towards Rittenhouse, towards his defense. I, I see very few neutral decisions in his history. What we have is a judge who, from my perspective, has prejudged the trial in favor of Rittenhouse and has decided, again, even at the pretrial stage, to use every bit of his power to put his thumb on the scale towards Rittenhouse's side. And that was obvious before the trial started. I think now that the trial is going on, it's a little even more obvious to people how hostile he is to the prosecution, how much he's taking Rittenhouse's side, um, and how he is slanting the whole case. He's basically not allowing the prosecution to put on its case against Rittenhouse. Before the trial began, the judge decided to not allow the prosecution to call the three people Rittenhouse shot as victims, though he ruled the defense could call them rioters and looters. A double standard, says Ms. Dull. You want to say they can't be called victims because of the nature of the self-defense defense? All right, you can kind of defend that decision. But then he says they can be called looters, rioters, and arsonists, which is ridiculous. The, the surviving victim hasn't been charged with looting, rioting, or arson. Meanwhile, prosecutors could ask the jury to consider lesser charges, a move that could secure conviction for some crimes but take more egregious charges like homicide and a possible life sentence off the table. Closing arguments will be held Monday. I'm Christina Onestead, reporting for KPFA. An attorney for one of the defendants on trial for killing Ahmad Arbery requested the presiding judge bar black pastors from entering the courtroom. After civil rights leader, the Reverend Al Sharpton sat in the courtroom yesterday. Three men are on trial for chasing down and shooting Arbery, killing him. They say they thought he was a thief. His family says he was jogging. Attorney Kevin Koff, who's representing William Rody Bryan, argued the black pastor's consoling and supporting Arbery's family in the courtroom was intimidating. The idea that we're going to be serially bringing these people in to sit with the victim's family one after another, obviously there's only so many pastors they can have. And if they're pastors Al Sharpton right now, that's fine. But then that's it. We don't want any more black pastors coming in here or other Jesse Jackson, whoever was in was in here earlier this week, sitting with the victim's family, trying to influence a jury in this case. Presiding Judge Timothy Walmsley declined and noted no formal motion on the defense's protest had been made. I don't hear a motion, and I will tell you this, I'm not going to blanketly exclude members of the public from this courtroom. Jurors in the trial watched security camera videos that showed Arbery and other people entering a home under construction in the months before he was killed. He was running at the site when the three white men chased him down and shot him. None of the video shows Arbery took anything, although it does show a couple of white people taking items from the construction site. South Africa's last white apartheid-era president, F.W. de Klerk, has died at the age of 85. De Klerk shared the Nobel Peace Prize with the nation's longtime freedom fighter and first post-apartheid president, Nelson Mandela, for their joint efforts to pave the way to a peaceful transition to a multiracial democracy in their country. The last president of apartheid, South Africa, F.W. de Klerk, dead today at the age of 85. 
Mostly sunny tomorrow in the San Francisco Bay Area with highs from the mid to upper 60s around the bay to the lower 70s further inland. Partly cloudy in the central San Joaquin Valley tomorrow with a high of 70 degrees. Sunny and continued exceptionally warm with highs in the upper 80s in the Los Angeles area tomorrow. That's it for the news tonight for this Thursday, November 11th. I'm Mark Merkel. Good evening. Tune in Thursday nights, starting at 7 p.m. for Apex Express, a weekly magazine-style radio show featuring the voices and stories of Asians and Asian Americans from all corners of their communities. Then at 8, it's a unique mix of singer-songwriter, folk, rock, soul, country, and R&B on The Bonnie Simmons Show. Finally, at 10 p.m., The Here and Now with Dirk Richardson, bringing you a mix of singer-songwriters to avant-garde jazz, old faves, new voices, and live performances. That's Thursday nights on 94.1 KPFA and kpfa.org. You're listening to 94.1 KPFA, 89.3 KPFB in Berkeley, 88.1 KFCF in Fresno, 97.5 K248BR in Santa Cruz and online worldwide at kpfa.org.